Matthew chapter 5, we're kind of preaching on the Mount, uh, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And boy, I'm having trouble. I'm just in the foothills, amen. I ain't even got up on the big side of the bluff yet. And, but verse number 10 through 12, everybody loves these verses. Uh, you hear these verses quoted all the time, and you hear people singing about them and jumping up and down about these verses. <laughs> verses 10 through 12. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. Everybody said hut. Amen. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse number 11. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you. And then all the people said. Amen. And persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. And boy, we don't, we, in those, and how many of this some of your favorite verses in the Bible? You don't ever hear nobody say, my favorite verse is Matthew 5, 10 through 12. I just love getting persecuted. I just love it when things go rough. I tell you, I just jump for joy. You know, I ain't never heard nobody say that's their life verse. That's my life verse. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And yet, in the middle of these verses, God is continually telling us, rejoice, be glad. Your reward is great. Be happy. If you, if you get persecuted for Jesus' sake and not for being stupid's sake. For Jesus' sake. He said, rejoice and be glad, exceeding glad. Now, well, think about that. He didn't just say be glad. He said, be exceeding glad. Now, you'd think we'd kind of like these verses. And he said, verse 12, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Lord, help us to preach today. Help us preach fast and furious. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to preach with the power of God. Lord, I need help to feed the flock of God. Lord, we need help. God, we didn't come to church just to have a social club meeting. I could have went to a restaurant this morning and visited with people. But God, I'll tell you, I need to hear from heaven. And I'll tell you, Lord, I need the help to feed the flock of God. I pray, Lord, that you'll help us this morning, that the Holy Ghost will come and be our preacher and our teacher today and our inspirer and our encourager today, Lord, and our comforter. And, Lord, I pray, Lord, quicken us and strengthen us and cause us to be stronger people than when we got here. I pray, Lord, help us today to get on fire for the things of God. And, Lord, I pray, help us to see from the heavenly view instead of from the humanly view. And I pray, Lord, today that you'll save somebody before we leave this building in Jesus' name. And help us, Lord, to aggravate the devil. Help us to encourage, uh, Lord, the saints of God today. Help us, Lord, to put a fire in their soul and a smile on their face, God, about the truth of the Bible. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, Second uh, uh, Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 18, is an old favorite verse of many people. It says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, there's a, a situation in that verse that teaches us a great Bible principle. And it's a great life principle. It wouldn't matter if you weren't saved. Wouldn't matter, I mean, in all honesty, there's a principle here. It's a universal principle. That means it works. Don't matter where you're at, what you're doing. And that is, it's all how you look at things. It's all how you, a lot, most of life is how you're looking at what's going on in your life. And Paul said, we don't walk by sight. He said, we walk by faith. And he said, because we walk by faith and not by sight, we can rejoice in persecution. We can rejoice in trials. We can see things differently than the world sees it. And when bad, quote, things happen to good people, we can see or, and have faith to know that God is working good through that. And so what uh, Jesus is teaching us to do in this passage of Scripture is that, and, he's, and he's teaching us this, that if you lived out the Beatitudes and you, you humble yourself and you get saved and, and you have a, a heart for it, you be meek and you grow in the Lord and so forth, you're going to get persecution if you live. Yea, all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And uh, I want to say something to you. I think persecution is coming and more and more and more to Christian people in this country. And I think we ought to get prepared for it. And we can by the Word of God. In the book of First Peter it says this, Whom in having not seen, we love. He's saying, hey, there's a heavenly view and there's an earthly view. Uh, the Bible said in Hebrews chapter 12, looking unto Jesus, that's a heavenly view. And it says, run the race with patience, that's a humanly view. And the Bible's all the time showing you these two views that you have in life. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago about a man, elderly man, who uh, uh, a pastor said he, uh, said he came walking into his church and he had lost his wife. In recent weeks, and said, I went back there to see him during the interim between Bible class and, and between church time. And he said, I, I, I just burdened for him. And he said, how you doing? How you feeling? 
And the old man looked up at him and he said this, and this preacher said this, and he said, I learned something from that old man that day. And he said, when I got to thinking about what he said, I got all of a sudden I began to see it all through Scripture. And he said, it depends on how you look at it. He said, it depends on how I look at it. He said, from the human side, he said, my heart's broken. That's been my bride wife since I was a teenage boy. And he said, I'm lonely from the human side. My heart's broken and I'm lonely. But he said, pastor from the heavenly side. He said, I'm looking forward to going to glory, and I'm looking forward to seeing Jesus, and I'm looking forward to seeing her, and everything's bright and lovely. Let's have church. Yeah. Amen. Amen? You see, it's how he's going to look at it. You see, this morning, sitting in these pews this morning, there's all kinds of things happening in all kind, every one of your lives. There's trouble here. There's happiness here. There's sorrow here. And there's things coming. You don't have an idea that's coming to you yet. And it's all going to be how you're looking at it. Are you looking at life, and this is what I want to preach on, boys. Are you looking at life from a human viewpoint or from a heavenly viewpoint? And I want you to get help. You know, when I come to church, I want to get help. I mean, I want to get help for what I've got to face this coming week. And so I want to say this to you in a way of introduction this morning. That if you only see life from a human point, you better get you a big bottle of Prozac and eat them like M&M's. Because you're going to be full of sorrow and misery and depression all the time. I mean to tell you what, if you're going to see life only from the human viewpoint, and the things that are happening to you in your life only from the human viewpoint, you're not going to have any joy. You're going to sit here in church, and you're just going to kind of go through it and float through it, and you're going to eventually decide that church doesn't have any relevance to your life. It doesn't mean anything. It really doesn't affect your real life. But you're going to go through the motions because there is this issue of faith in you. And if you're going to look at life through a human viewpoint all the time, you get ready to live under a dark cloud. You get ready to live a dull life. You get ready to live a sold up life, a depressed life, an aggravated life, an irritated life, and you'll never see the sunshine because you see life only from the human viewpoint. I don't know how anybody can have any joy if they never see life from the heavenly view. I don't see how they could. I'm honest with you. There's an old song that says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Now, I want to ask you a question this morning. How do you live your life? Now, I'm telling you this morning, according to this Bible, there's no accidents in the world. You listening to me? There are no accidents. You say, why? Well, last week I preached on the book of Esther, which teaches the sovereignty of God. That God is a providential, sovereign God, and He is over all, and there's no accidents. I, I, I do believe, though, that we're living in a sin-cursed world where death has entered in, and sin and the curse and the effects of sin and the curse are at work in people's lives. But I believe in a sovereign God. And God is not up in heaven this morning, wringing His hands, wondering what in the world is going on with America. He's not. I hate to shock you. I know Fox News is. I know CNN. And I know uh, the politician and everybody's out here. Oh, my land of living. I don't know what in the world. Uh, I mean, America's committing suicide. It, it really is. But God's not up there wringing his hands about it, folks. And I want to take that right viewpoint, a heavenly viewpoint, a viewpoint from the viewpoint of God will strengthen you and help you and fill you with joy and gladness and make you want to live every day to its fullest. I'm telling you, I'm not running with this crowd this dull discouraged, depressed, down and out, griping and groaning and moaning, Ben read in the in devotion this morning about the people moaning and groaning, and it displeased God, amen. Hey, you know what? I had breakfast this morning. Thank you, Lord. I had a bed to sleep on last night. Thank you, Lord. I got up this morning, got to live in the Ozarks. Woo! Glory, hallelujah. I ain't living in New York City. Bless God Almighty, amen. I live in America. You know, it's just how you look at things. The sad part about it is, see, like the more we get, the worse it looks to us. I never saw, I mean, it's just unbelievable. And God's not wringing his hands, and God is not going out of business. Good news, amen. And God's not on vacation. He's in total control, and he is absolutely knows where every sparrow has fallen in the last 24 hours between here in Moscow and everywhere else on the earth. And I'm going to tell you something that shocked the living daylights out of you. He knows the count of every hair of every head on six feet in some people this morning. That's God, amen. So what are you worried about? Now, if you're worried, it's telling me that you're not trusting in that God this morning. So quit worrying. Be careful for nothing, the Bible said. And look at it from a heavenly viewpoint. I want to tell you something right now. I just really believe this, that after a while, if, the, if you don't have some joy, you ain't never been saved. If you can live for 32 years claiming you're saved and mope it all the way through, you didn't get what I got. You just didn't get it. Amen. You say, well, you don't have to be happy to be saved. Hmm. 
I don't know about that. Too much in the Bible about joy of the Lord to be in your strength. Too much in about the fruit of the Spirit being love, joy, and peace. Amen. And I'm telling you something. I believe that. So that being said, though, I understand that God hadn't quit on us. God's not up there wondering why this morning. That being said, I want to live, and I want the people of this church to live. Linda, wake up back there. <laughs> he told me in the bathroom, he said, you'll have to give me a CD. I'm going to sleep on you. I said, not if I can help it. I'll be in the middle of your lap right in the middle of the server waking you up. Amen. But that being said, I want the people of this church to live with a heavenly view. Now, you may not do it. And I may not do it all the time. But I'd sure like for this church to live with a heavenly view as opposed to a humanly view about the issues of your life. Now, this requires, though, some serious business and decisions about what the Bible said. Now, it does. You can't, see, you can't just, oh, I'm going to think positive today. <laughs> that don't do it. If you're going to have the heavenly view, you've got to be in the heavenly book. And you've got to take seriously the stuff this book says. For instance, we are created for His glory. We are created for His pleasure, not ours. The Bible said that we're to set our affections on things above, not on things of the earth. The Bible said that we're pilgrims and strangers in this earth. The Bible said that there's a world beyond this life and that this life is a preparation time for that world. That we're to live in light of that. The Bible said that we're to live and walk by faith and not by sight. The Bible said that we're to understand the things which are seen are temporal not and the things that are not seen are eternal. The Bible said that we're to lay our treasures up in heaven. The Bible said we're to live for God and live for others and serve them and not ourselves. The Bible says that all things work together for them that love the Lord and them according to His purpose. The Bible said be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The Bible said, love not this way. You see, I said there's some serious things you've got to get down in your heart and your mind if you're going to have a heavenly view, and I'm giving you a bunch of them. The Bible said, friendship with this world is enmity with God. The Bible said, come out and be separate from this world. Touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you. The Bible said, Jesus is going away to prepare a place for us. And He's prepared a place for us. He's coming again to receive us under ourselves that we can be with Him. And the Bible says, I'm going to tell you, you cannot see a heavenly view if you don't get those cardinal truths of the Bible down inside your soul. You just can't do it. You just can't do it. That's why you'll be listening to Orphan. Well, if she can help you, and Dr. Phil, if he can help you. And you want some preacher to counsel you. <laughs> Amen. I wouldn't give a plug nickel for all the counselors that are turning out in every Bible college across America. I'm sorry if that offends you, but you'll just have to be offended. Well, we need some good old-fashioned Bible preaching. Amen? I'll tell you what, if you get right with God, you won't need a psychiatrist. You'll be jumping up and down, happy with the Lord. You can feel the Holy Spirit of God. You won't need that junk. You get right with people, you'll be fine. Won't cost you a dime. Amen. I'm telling you, listen, uh, you have to have. Now, listen to me. Not only do you have to have these truths in view, but you have to have the illuminating and empowering Work of the Holy Ghost taking these truths and applying them and empowering them in your life. It's not even just enough to know them. You've got to have the power of the Holy Ghost working in you to live them out. Yeah. Amen. I'm telling you, if you don't, it'll pull you down and it'll pull you away where you cannot see the heavenly view of life. You can only see that human view. Now, whether you see life from a heavenly viewpoint or a heavenly, human viewpoint or heavenly viewpoint, is going to determine your joy and your peace, your fulfillment, your purpose, or your fullness and excitement of life. How do you see that? I'll tell you something. You're talking, you're looking at a preacher. I'll tell you, I hope when my teeth are gone, <laughs> I hope when I'm in a walker, I hope I'm still, I hope I get a, a motor on a walker and run around this church in it. I want to tell you something. I hope, and my spirit is renewed day by day. My spirit's getting happier all the time, even though my flesh is wearing out. That's the truth. It's the truth. So, now somebody has said, well now, Brother Reggie, you're going to get so heavenly minded, you'll be of no earthly good. That's an old famous saying. And it's a lie. You ain't never met somebody, you have never met anybody so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. I've never been so heavenly minded. You ain't so heavenly minded. Don't sit there and say, all right, I'll have your wife to get up and testify about you and then let tell the truth about it. I'll tell you something. The trouble is, we're not heavenly minded enough. 
We're not heavenly minded enough. That's our real problem. When I when I get in this mode, I'm gonna tell you something. This lecture looks like a mess. Don't do. Look like I'm telling you. I can't tell you. I'm waiting. Humanly minded. Humanly minded. I'm telling you, I couldn't sleep last night. Humanly minded. I'm gonna tell you something. I don't know what the rest of the world's doing, but I want to do what this book is. Amen. I want to have a heavenly viewpoint of life. Now that being said, let's, I want to ask you some questions. How do you look at people? You see. Because you say, well, Reggie, that, well, that's really good teaching. You're up there bounce, down, bouncing around talking about that. Yeah, yeah, it's just you. You're just, you're just hyperactive. Your mother didn't know how to take care of it and just passed into your childhood. I mean, passed into your adulthood. <laughs> hey, let's make it practical. Number one, how do you look at people? You see, everything's coming down there. I can get up here and go on like this for a little bit. Pretty soon it has to come down to reality. When you walk out of this building, when you're in this church house, right now today, right now when I'm preaching, how are you looking at people? Let me show you something in the Bible. John chapter 9, verse number 1. Jesus' disciples walking down the road. Land the you wait back here. And the, you shouldn't have never said that back there in the bathroom. Amen. John, Jesus said his disciples walking down the road. There's a blind man sitting over there. His disciples, bless God, they're pretty spiritual. They're walking with Jesus, aren't they? They're mean, you know, he picked them out, didn't he, Jim? He said, hey, Jesus, who sinned, uh, that man or his parents, that he was born blind? He learned something right there. Those men had a human viewpoint. You know what Jesus said? Neither. But that the works of God might be made manifest. That boy was born blind. Are you listening to me? You had a child born, something wrong with it. Oh, I said, you know what I had? Listen to me. I had a preacher call me yesterday. He's got a problem in his home. He's crying. And he's blaming himself. Can I tell you something? If he's in the will of God, and I believe he is, what the devil had him doing was looking at the human side of that situation instead of the heavenly side of the situation. It was tearing him up. You listen to how you were looking at things this morning, determine how happy you are this morning, how free and joyful you are in the Lord this morning. Those disciples walk in there, uh, can he, and they said, well, who's sinned, him or his mom or dad? Yeah. Jesus said, neither one of them have sinned. You know what they were doing? They were seeing the human side of it. I want to ask you something. How do you see people? How do you see what's going on in people's lives? You see, what, what, what those disciples had is what Reggie Kelly has a lot, a critical, humanly-minded, carnal-minded thinking system that if you live for God, bad things won't happen to you. You believe that a lot more than you think you will if you ain't careful. You know how I know that? Lord, why? The reason we say, Lord, why, is because we thought that bad things should not happen to godly people. This health and wealth club preaching that's going all over America will make you think that if you're not wealthy and wealthy, you're not living right. That's a lie. That's a stinking, stupid, hell, out of hell lie. And it's being perpetrated by some of the biggest name preachers in America. And you know I'm telling you the truth. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible teaches that good and godly people suffer. That's what Matthew 5, 10 through 12 is teaching you. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, peacemakers. Over. Who's, getting, who's going to hit the suffering with? Those who are living godly for Jesus Christ. I'm telling you this. What about the martyrs who died burning at the stake? Which history is full of, by the way. And tonight, I'm gonna, I may preach on suffering, in the, literal suffering tonight for Jesus' sake. What about Paul, who suffered, shipwrecked, and all that thing? I mean, the, beaten with rods. What about Job and Joseph and these godly people that suffered and bad things happened in their life? And we're talking about rough things, dying, tortured, hurt. The Bible said they were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might attain a better resurrection. What about the prophets? What about Jesus? I'm serious. Here's what I'm saying. Jesus saw that blind man, that he was ha- that happened to him, and was working in his life for the glory of God. If we, see on- if we see people only from the human side, we're going to be critical. We're going to be guessing what they did to that, beca- that, 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 the reason that happened in their life. We're going to be talking about, the, you know, we, we look at somebody, maybe they don't have money, and we think, well, they must be lazy. And that's not always the case. Maybe they've not had the opportunity that somebody else has had. Maybe they've had knocks and hits that you never knew nothing about. Maybe I ought to keep my mouth shut, Donnie. Maybe I'm not seeing what God is doing in their life by the, by, the, by the rotation of poverty that God has put in their life. I'm just saying this, that we need to watch what we think. We, we can get pharisaical if we're not careful and holier than thou. 
and miss the real truth that God is working all things together for good to them that love the Lord, even though it might be a disease, even though it might be some heartache or death or sickness or poverty or hurt or harm or whatever it is, God's still working it out. I'm telling you, listen, we need to learn the early church. You know what the church saw in Saul? They saw a person. Listen, to this. here it is. The church saw in Saul of Tarsus, they saw a persecutor. But what did God see in him? God saw a powerhouse for the gospel of Jesus Christ, taking the gospel to the world. He said, Reggie, where are you going with this? Here's where I'm going. I want to ask you a question. And I'm preaching to myself. I believe in standards. I believe you ought to live clean. I believe you ought to do right. But I'm going to ask you a question. Somebody walked in here this morning with a ponytail down to his backside. What would be your thoughts? What would be the first way you looked at that man? What if somebody walked in here this morning with tattoos all over his arm and his neck? What if some gal walked in here with tattoos all over her neck this morning and, and you know, dressed up to her rear end and tattoos on her legs and an earring in her nose? What would you say? What would you, how would you honestly think? How would you see those people? You know what's the matter with the church in America? You know why we're not having a revival? Because we quit seeing people like Jesus see them. We quit seeing people like God sees them. And we get, a little, we, we get, some, we get saved and we get sanctified and we get a little bit, you know, uh, 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 got some convictions. And bless God Almighty, everybody else ought to be like us now. We lose our burden for the lost. We become pharisaical. Hey, I'll tell you right now, when the Pharisee and the publican walked into church, right? They come in there. You know what that Pharisee saw in the publican? He saw him as a, he said, like, even as this publican. But you know what God saw? The, the, the Pharisee saw from a human viewpoint, but God saw from a heavenly viewpoint. And it was all the different, different difference in the world. Now, I'm, am, I, am I advocating tattoos, ponytails? No, no, no. I'm not pointing that, but I'm going to tell you something. Behind that ponytail is a man Jesus died for. And if this church forgets that, we're going to die. You listen to me. You bring them, I'll preach them. Amen. Some boy comes in here with an ear ring in his ear. You know what? If we're not careful, that's all we think about. That's all we see is, oh, well, well, I'll tell you what, a little, a little old rebel, a little sorry, low down thing. We don't even give them a track. We don't even talk to them. We, you know what? I'm telling you. Listen, and I'm preaching to myself, but I know God wants this church to have this message. If we're not careful, we will become pharisaical. We don't see people for how God sees them. I'll tell you, some little snotty-nosed kid comes in here, and he's got snot all over his nose. And he goes like that, and he wipes it on the seat. That's all you can do. <laughs> he puts snot on our feet. Can you believe it? Get that kid somewhere else. Shouldn't we have a nursery pastor? No, bless God, put him on your lap. Get your handkerchief. Tell him to be quiet and listen to the preacher. Huh? Hey, man. I'm talking about, listen. How about when somebody walks in here and smelly, their clothes, they've got liquor on their breath, tobacco on their breath. Some drug head walks in here, looks oodle-eyed at you. What if some devil-possessed man walked in here? He's got two choices, get saved or go into eternity. Amen. <laughs> Some of you knew I'd say that. Well, I want to ask you a question. When Jesus Christ stepped out of the boat on the Sea of Galilee up on the Gadarean side, and that demon-possessed man in Mark chapter 5 came out there with no clothes on, who had torn at himself and cut himself, and people had tied him up with chains and they couldn't hold him, how did Jesus look at him? Did he look at him and say, man, he's gone? You know what he did? He saved him. Did you know something? I don't want to ever forget who I was before God saved me. And I want to tell my family something. First of all, I want to tell my brothers and my mom and dad something. None of you know how sorry I was. None of you know how wicked I was. And I'm sorrier than you think I am. And I needed to save you worse than you ever think I did. And I want to tell my kids, you will never know. What a dirtbag your dad was. You will never know what it meant for God to save me. Now, I may never know what it meant for God to save you, but you don't know what it meant for God to save me. And the day I forget the pit from which I was dug is the day I'm done. 
There's, I, I'm no good for the gospel because the gospel is for sinners, amen. It's not for the self-righteous crowd. And if this church wants to see revival, we'll get our eyes on the ponytailers and the two tattooers and the ear ringers and the drug heads and the jailhouse crowd. And the revival that we're having is because we got some men who's not afraid to go where it stinks. Where's... Oh, man, my brain. Brother Rob's son. Francis, are you here? Somebody told me you led a guy to the Lord last week in jail. Christ, is that right? I'm not going to say the name. But I will say this is one of the meanest names in southern Missouri. I'm talking about the worst. Branson, I don't know what was in that man's heart. I have no idea what he'll do with what you gave him. But I want to tell you one thing, buddy. Don't you ever stop giving gospel to the worst. Because the truth about it is, in this church, this is the first church of the salvage yard. And I'll tell you, if it weren't for the grace of God, each one of us would be in jail, prison, dead, or in hell. If it wasn't for the grace of God, I want to tell you something right now. Houston, if it wasn't for the grace of God, you'd been raised in a drug head, drunken home. God hadn't got a hold of Donnie, he'd probably beat you and wife every day morning just to, just to have fun for breakfast. He's that mean without Jesus Christ. Ain't that right, Donnie? I preach that in my family, amen. You have to be a pretty good brother to hang with me like these boys have, I'll tell you that. How'd you like to have a brother get up and preach and say stuff like that? I'm going to tell you something, listen to me. We've got to start seeing people like Jesus sees people. I, I'm telling you something, now you listen to me. This ain't no average message this morning. This is a revival message for this church at this time in the history of this church. God wants us to get our eyes back on tell you something. Whenever we see those people that we think, man, alive, you know, why don't they straighten up? Looks like they know better than that. They look, I'm going to tell you something. Wouldn't it be, just this week, just think about this. Just this week, bless God Almighty, a, 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 a ninth, a, not the ninth, but the dis, a, a, oh man, I can't even think this morning. Court down in the southeast part of the United States, ruled, a superior court ruled against a lower court about a man who was a professor in, in a college in North Carolina, I believe it was. He used to be an atheist. He had been hired in 1993, had tenure and all this stuff, and uh, was admired and respected and bragged on by everybody in the country, and he got saved. Oh, my land, he got saved. And when he got saved, he really got saved. And he talked about what Jesus did for him just as much as he talked about atheism in the college beforehand. And did you know what that college did? They fired that man. I'm going to tell you something. Listen to me. You know what I'm saying? And the court overturned it and said you can't fire him. He's expressing his beliefs now just as he was then. Put him back in. Amen. And I'll tell you, listen to me. I'm saying this this morning that we've got to start seeing that. But who would have thought? I wondered. You know what I wondered? Who was the man who won him to Christ? Who was the man who said that atheistic professor can become a trophy of Jesus Christ's grace in the cross? Who saw that man not as an atheist professor, but as a man who could be saved and redeemed? Boy, I want to tell you something. How do we see sinners? James chapter 2. I'll just paraphrase this in Reg Kelly deal. You know, said, you got a rich man comes in wearing nice clothes and stuff. You tell him, come on up here and sit right up here. Would you please? Here. An old poor man comes in. He says, eh, you better sit back in the back somewhere. God says, you're a judge of persons, right? You're a respecter of persons. God says, get away from that trash. I want to tell you something. Listen to me. I want this church. I tell you, I want it to be a smorgasbord restaurant for a lost world. I want a lost man to feel like he can come to this church. I had a man here a while back told me. He said, Reggie, he had a phony tail. He said, I'd come down. He said, I listen to you on CD. He said, I like what you preach. He said, I'm afraid you'd run me out if I came down there. I said, I wouldn't run you out. Oh, he said, I know that I shouldn't have said that. But he said, you know, he said, I know you don't go for ponytails. I said, that's right. I said, I'll tell you why. The Bible says it's a shame for men to have long hair. Nature teaches you that. I told him right there. I said, I ain't gonna say something to you. I ain't gonna say something behind the pulpit, I won't tell you right here. You brought it up. Now you brought it up. I said, but I love you. And I said, God loves you. But you know what I found out? The man's saved. He just ain't got where he needs to get yet. Amen. He doesn't understand that, that could be offensive and that's not that's not biblical. But what I'm telling you is this is that we've got to see past what's on the outside and see people for who they can be in the Lord Jesus Christ. What do we want or wish for people to see in us? What we were or what we are? I want to see what it can be in the Lord. Amen. Outside the grace of God, all of us would still be 
just like what we condemn in other people. Behind that ponytail, behind that tattoo, behind that earring, behind that liquor breath is a soul Christ died for. And we need to see him that way. I did not get up here and say that we ought not take a stand. Did I? And I didn't fail to take a stand when I was hit with it. But you've got to do it in the right way. Amen. And I'll tell you something. I, I, I don't want sinners to feel comfortable here, but I want them to feel welcome and loved here. Amen. That's what I want. I uh, read an amazing story the other day. Just, I just read what I like to read. <clears throat> it was a book I believe Mr. Gase gave me about the Depression days. And down here in Arkansas, there's a lady who was a school teacher. And she walked two and a half miles to go teach this school. And the reason I was so interested in this story because my grandmother did that kind of thing. My daddy's mother, she taught one-room schoolhouses. And uh, this lady walked two and a half miles to teach this little old group of kids in an old run-down schoolhouse down there in some old back part of Arkansas, back in the mountains. And she bought, this is like 1934, 1935, the Depression is really down. I mean, it's hit everybody. And she walks to school one morning. She always gets there early, get things ready for school. And lo and behold, a family has moved into the schoolhouse. <laughs> and she says, what in the world is this? And there's this old beat down car there. And she walked up in there and they have got boxes lined up against the wall. They set up a little old steel one bed and put a pallet on the floor in the back of the schoolhouse. And they've moved into the school. She walks up the steps and like she says, man, this ain't going to work. I've got to have school. What did these people think they're doing moving into school? And she walked inside and there was a man and his pregnant wife, very new baby soon, and two kids and the, and the wife's mother. All right. They moved in. Her first impulse was to get somebody down here and get, <laughs> you can't do this. And something just come over, and she said, uh, what, what's the deal? And he said, well, my wife's very, very close. We have no place. I don't want her to have this baby in the car in some cold winter night. And he said, we just saw this old schoolhouse, and we just, we just need to put a bed somewhere. Please let us rest. And you know what that school teacher did? She said, well, she said, uh, I want you just to make sure you're all in the back here. Keep everything in the back. And if you won't disturb classes, and I'll tell you what else to do. If you'll cut wood and clean the schoolhouse and pick and do a lot of work that needs to be done around here, I'll let you stay a little while. Very good. Yeah. And they stayed, and they, and, and, and they she said what happened was the grandma and the mother and the kids they would, after school was dismissed, they would ask her all kinds of questions. They had never been to school, didn't know, and they were all excited about learning. They became some of her best students. And the, and the, and the dad, he just cut wood and picked up around there and done, done everything he could, you know, and she let them sleep and stay in there. And then what happened was people started appreciating them, and they started bringing food to them and helping them be a blessing. And she said, and this is what was really funny to me, she said, one morning I was coming to school early like regular, and I heard some racket. And she said, I got up there and said, she is having that baby. Not long. She said, I mean, about time school's supposed to start. She said, I ran back up the road and I caught the first batch of kids. And I said, kids, y'all just stay up here for a while till you hear me ring the bell. And just play and have a good time. And she went back down there and delivered that baby in that schoolhouse. And that baby became almost the school mascot. And they, everybody loved that baby. And the day they left, and she said that finally he got a chance to heard about some work, and he went, and they got baby got going, everything got through. And she said the day they left, the whole community come down and cried and gave him food and so forth and cried and left. Man, I read that. T- I said, hey, Reggie, if somebody came up to church, and, hey, folks, can I tell you something? I don't want to be, I'm not a doomsday, but I want to tell you this much, that our economy could collapse. And we could see grocery stores empty, and we could see no gas, and we could see that type of life again. Now, I'm not for letting somebody who could work and won't work. I mean, I think, hey, die or work, that's the way I look at it. But for somebody, if we, what, that, that teacher, you know what the story at the end? The story at the end, the writer of the story said, that was a wonderful teacher, and the reason I know, because that teacher was my mother. 
And I'm just saying this to you this morning, that how do we look at people? Johnny, if I, I said, Reggie, how would have you looked at that, that family when they walked in? Would you have said, now listen, I, yeah, yeah, I know you're in bad shape, but you can't stay here. God help us to see people from the heavenly viewpoint. How did Paul see the jailer in Acts chapter 16? How did Jesus see the maniac? When we start seeing people from a heavenly viewpoint instead of a humanly viewpoint, you and I will have, and this church will have a revival. But man alive, this ain't going as fast as it needs to go, Kenny. Y'all be praying. Number two, not only how do we see... What did I say? I don't know, man. I tell you, how, it's hot. It, am I the only one hot? I mean, I am hot. Anyway, number two, how do we look at people? Number two, how do we look at problems? How are you looking at your problems? Heavenly viewpoint, earthly viewpoint. I, I, let me give you an illustration on that. Peter's walking. Peter's in the boat. Jesus is coming out on the water, and the disciples look out and say, is "That you, Jesus?" And he says, "Yeah, it's I." And he bid him come to him. Oh, Peter. I mean. <laughs> I like old Peter, amen. He may open his mouth too much, but I'll tell you what, he'd try things. He climbed out of that boat. He just, you know what he did? He just took God at his word. Here he goes, steps out of the boat. He's walking across the water. Somebody, yeah, and he sunk too. Well, I want to tell you something. Till you beat on Peter, why don't you try walking on the water? He still holds the world's record. He still holds the world's record. Can I tell you something? The very fact that people say, well, yeah, but he sunk. They're looking at a human viewpoint. The fact that he walked a while, heavenly viewpoint, Amen. And so, but you, here's the secret of that thing. The Bible teaches us, doesn't it, that as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, the waves were underneath his feet. But when he took his eyes off the heavenly view and put them on the humanly view, he started sinking. And that's the whole deal. I'm telling you something. The problems that you have in your life, I, I'm going to say it, and if y'all hate my guts for it, uh, Houston, you can just kick me out to them. But Houston, you had a little girl. How, how many years ago? How was Ava? How, how was Ava? Six? Should be six. Houston had a little girl. And Houston? She didn't, she didn't come out normal, did she? She's like everybody else. Aren't you glad? <laughs> Amen? Normal's pretty rotten in America anymore. Amen? <laughs> no, but what I'm saying to you is, you know, Houston, I've I thought about this a lot. I ain't never talked too much, have I? I ain't hardly ever said anything to you. But can I tell you something I've watched? I'm going to tell you something. God's seen her just like you ordered her. And God showed me. God showed me something, Dean. He says, Reggie, people look at things humanly. Oh, isn't that terrible? Isn't that too bad? Isn't that a shame? We can look at it and say, oh, my, how much labor that's going to cost me all my life. What's this going to mean to me and my wife and our family and, and where we go and what we're able to do? And if we're not careful, we look at it humanly and we think it's terrible. But God tells us to look at it Heavenly. And I'll tell you how God got a hold of me on this. That little girl would come up to me. And when I got done preaching, and she would just come up and all she wanted me to do was just hold her and hug her. Then she'd really take off. And all of it's like the Lord said, Reggie, take a look heavenly. And I thought about those disciples, how they saw that blind man. And Houston, I thought about you, and I want to say something to you. Don't you ever listen to the devil's lies. Well, that's because of your sin. Do you listen to me? I'm your pastor. And I believe God wanted me to tell you that, and I believe God wants me to tell you that. Quit beating yourself up. Maybe, yes, I know we reap what we sow. But isn't it possible for God to take things and work them out for good? Isn't it possible that God maybe is trying to get us to see things from a heavenly viewpoint instead of a humanly viewpoint? That things are not, what the world calls bad isn't all bad. And that God can turn it into something for good. What about Joseph when his brothers, you know what I'm talking, he had a problem, amen. He had a bunch of brothers, hated his guts. But you know what Joseph did? He looked at it from a heavenly viewpoint and said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to save many people, much people alive. I'm talking about when the problems come in our lives, how do we look at it? Do we look at the Savior or do we look at the storm? The devil's a liar. You know that, don't you? When we have health problems, are we looking at it from the human side? Oh, my land. Oh, my land. Oh, my land. Oh, my land. Or are we looking at it from the heavenly side? I'm getting closer. I'm getting closer home. 
What about our finances? Let me tell you something. Just because somebody goes broke don't mean they ain't godly. And going broke may be one of the best, oh, one of the best things that ever happened to you. I love this. I, I copied it off. Listen, this is a story. Sally Wall's father died, and after he died, she found this account that he had written in his personal effects. He had written this in the early 30s in the midst of the Depression. And the name of his article that he wrote to himself was, I like the Depression. And here's what he wrote. I like the Depression. No more prosperity for me. I've had more fun since the Depression started than I ever had in my life. I had forgotten how to live and what it meant to have real friends and what it was like to eat common everyday good food. Fact is, I was getting a little too high hat. It's great to drop into a store and feel you can spend an hour or two or three, even half a day just visiting and not feel like you're wasting valuable time. I like the Depression. I'm getting acquainted with my neighbors I've never known before and following the biblical admonition to love them. Some of them have been living next to me three years, and now we butcher hogs together. I like the Depression. I, hadn't been, I haven't been out to a party in 18 months, and my wife has dropped all of her clubs, and I believe we're falling in love all over again. I'm pretty satisfied with her, and I think I'll keep her. I'm feeling better since the Depression. I get more exercise because I have to walk everywhere I go. And lots of folks who used to drive Cadillacs, well, they're walking with me. I like the Depression. I'm getting real honest to good food now. Three years ago, we ate filet of soil, whatever that is, crab louis, Swiss steak with flour gravy. We had guinea hen and things called gourmet and oriental. Now we eat sow bosom with buttons on it. And I like it. <laughs> Listen, I like the Depression. Three years ago, I never had time to go to church. I played checkers and baseball every day, on, every Sunday, all day. And besides that, there wasn't a preacher in Texas that could tell me anything. But he said, now, I go to church regularly every Sunday. I never miss a Sunday. And if this depression keeps on, I'll probably start attending Wednesday night prayer meetings. Oh, yes. I like the depression. You say, what was that man doing? He had learned to see life from the heavenly viewpoint. Isn't that wonderful to leap? Now, now listen, he could have wrote, kids, I want you to know how bad this was. The dust blew yesterday for six hours. A third bank closed in town. We're out of shoes. I don't know what we're doing, going to do in this God-forsaken land. Wouldn't that have been encouraging to his kids? And some of you think you've got problems? <laughs> Amen. Let me tell you something. When you go broke, it's just God getting you out of that stupid, low, uh, sorry deal you was in and getting you on a better real deal. When that door closes, it's just God wanting to open a better door for you. Amen. You say, you don't know nothing about that. No, you're the one who don't know nothing about it. I know more about it than you think I know about it. And someday I'll preach on that. Job got hit with some bad problems. Everybody agree to that? His wife looked at it from the human's point. Curse God and die! Human viewpoint. Job said, Lord given, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Heavenly viewpoint. You said, wait a minute, Reggie, you haven't even, you're not even near what my problems are. I come from a broken home, and my dad hated my guts, and my mama left me, and I don't know, I don't know what happened to you. I really don't. I, I haven't been there, I'll admit that. But I'll tell you this much, it's all what you do with it. Amen. I think I told you about a little 15-year-old girl down in Georgia got saved here about three or four years ago. She got saved. She was a 15-year sophomore in high school got saved. Poor little thing went to a public school. Can you imagine? Look, she got saved. She graduated, they said, last year. I believe it was last year. year before. She graduated. And when they called her name, the principal of the school started crying at the microphone. And the whole place stood up. They sat down. People kept cheering. They stood up again. The whole place sat down pretty soon. They stood up again. She couldn't get across the platform. 
Finally, the principal, superintendent of school, gained his composure enough, and the crowd got quiet enough to say, for those of you who don't know what's going on, he said, this girl has led me and 16 other teachers and faculty of this school to Christ and 117 of her fellow students. You know where she come from? She got picked up. She got picked up on a church bus out of a trailer house, Dean, where her mother and her grandmother lived. And the doors wouldn't even shut on the stupid thing, and they had to go get their water because they didn't have water. They didn't have water in the trailer. They got their water from somewhere else to fill their stools with. Stringy-haired, 15-year-old, skinny girl, nobody in high school. But she got saved and fell in love with Jesus Christ. Led 17 teachers and 117 grown kids to Christ. Yeah, don't tell me how bad you got it. Oh, you don't know. I have a mom and dad that loves me and takes me to church and reads the Bible to me and prays with me. And you don't know how hard it is. And I have a preacher that really does believe the Bible and I have to listen to him preach. And I've got so many clothes in the closet, I have no idea how many dresses and shirts I have. Somebody ought to take you to the North Pole. Somebody ought to plant you down in the Amazon with the snakes for a while. Amen. Somebody ought to make you glad for what you've got. You're griping this morning. You're griping. Some of you grown up think you've really got it tough because you don't have that four-wheel drive truck with a hay stabber on the back of it yet. And we're griping. You know what? We're looking at things humanly. Oh, God, forgive me. Hey, man, I mean, I'm guilty. Well, number three. It's all right, Don. I got 16 (laughs) points. Just to encourage you, Brother Don, I got 16 points. (laughs) How do you look at persecution? That's what we read our text about. How do you look at it? You say, Reggie, I've been lied on, cheated, crooked, done dirty. I've been used. I've been hurt, harmed, slandered. It's all how you look at it. Joseph said, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. Jesus was on the cross, said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Stephen said, lay not this sin to their charge. The apostle Paul said, all men forsake me. But he said, I pray it may not be laid to their charge. Nevertheless, the Lord stood by me. I'm going to tell you something. Quit trying to fix it all and straighten it all out. You ain't never going to straighten it all out. There are people while you're sitting here who are talking about you being at church. Do you understand that? So get over it. There are people probably said you're a hypocrite when they saw your car head this way this morning. Get over it. Amen. 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 Quit trying to take vengeance. God said, vengeance is mine. I will repay, thus says the Lord. Hey, you ought to have mercy on those people. If God's going to take vengeance on them, they're in trouble. Enough without you worrying about it. Hey, you say, Reggie, I'm telling you, listen to me. Quit trying to fix everything. Just forgive them, go on, pray for them, love them. And one thing you need to really see is that your enemies are instruments in the hands of God. To conform you and I to the image of Jesus Christ. To burn out the dross in our life. To give, them, to give you and I opportunity to be salt and light. That's what it's all about. Why has God raised up these enemies? Why has He let them do it? For our good and for His glory. I believe, in, I believe and I practice praying for my enemies. I do. I pray for them. He said, Reggie, how you pray? Well, I, I pray, Lord, bless them. I Bless them with truth. Bless them with righteousness. Uh, you know, I, I bless their family. Keep their home together. Now you say, Reggie, what good's it done? Now I'm going to be honest with you. Best I can tell, I can't see it's done nickels worth of good for them. Let me tell you what's done for this old boy. It's kept me behind this pulpit. Are you listening to me? It's kept me going for God. It's kept some joy in my old soul. It may not have done them and may not be doing them any good. But it sure is doing this old preacher some good. Because God blesses, just like he said, when you pray for your enemies. I want to tell you something. Quit wasting our lives waiting for other people to make it right. They ain't going to. Can I tell you something? News flash, they're not going to. Probably not going to. (laughs) Why? We want to waste your life waiting on them to when they're not going to. (laughs) <laughs> number four still awake back here Linda? he is a thumbs up amen all the way how do we see 
people. Number one. Number two, how do we see problems? Number three, how do we see persecution? And number four, we're going to get out of here and go home and eat a wonderful dinner. How do we see the prodigal? How do we see the prodigal? You see, Rachel, what are you talking about? When somebody's life gets messed up with sin, and I mean they have crashed the airplane spiritually, how do you look at it? The Bible said, you which are, if a man be overtaken and fall, you which are spiritual, restore such a one. In the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be taken. Uh, you say, well, I ain't never backslid. I ain't never messed up. I ain't never gotten a hog pen. I'm very glad for you. I'm preaching to keep you out of there. Amen. But it's bad when God uses one to get you out. <laughs> no, listen. Most of us is going to need a second chance. Most of us are going to need a third chance and a fourth chance and a fifth chance. You remember the old prodigal son. Now, you listen to me. Wait, hang on here a little bit. You, don't you mistake what I'm saying because some of you little mercies need to get straightened up. <laughs> some of you think you don't understand the prodigal son's story. You never have understood it. And I don't, if God don't help you, you never will understand it. He repented. Yeah. Let's right. right. go, Donnie. He didn't walk up there and say, Dad, I'm back. Is there any cornbread in the pan? Yeah. <laughs> he didn't walk back in the house and say, Help kid get out of the bedroom. I'm back home. That's my bed. Yeah. He'd walk back in the, uh, up there at the farm and say, Bob, I'm home. Yeah. He'd walk back in church Sunday with his dad and say, Bless God, I'm back. He was broken. He was humble. He was repentant. He said, I've sinned. I'm no more worthy to be your son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Broken. Now understand that before I say what I'm getting ready to say. He didn't do like 98% of Americans do now. Walk back in church and act like you're nobody's supposed to think nothing about it. Come back to the family and act like everything should be fine. Oh, let's visit. Let's visit. He repented. Now but watch this. I'm going to tell you something. When somebody repents, you know something? I've never met a godly Christian in my life who would not forgive a repentant, backslidden brother. I've never met it in my life. No, I don't know of them. But I've met a few elder sons. And that elder son, all he could see was from the human side. All he could see was he spent the money, lived with the harlots, lived in the hog pen, disgraced the family. And now you're throwing him a party? You never did throw me a party. But his father saw it from the heavenly viewpoint. He said, this my son was lost, and now he's found. We're going to kill the fatted calf. He's home. I'm going to tell you something. There's some prodigals who won't come back into your life because they sense the spirit of the elder son. How do you look at prodigals? You say, well, he knew better than that. Let me tell you about the sad shape that we, our old wicked hearts can get into. We can almost feel good about the prodigal because it sure do make me look good. Ain't I sweet and holy? How do you look at people? How do you look at problems? How do you look at persecution? How do you look at the prodigal? I hope you look at it from the heavenly viewpoint, not the humanly viewpoint. That's what won't be done as we look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. I want you to leave here this morning helped. Would you do that? Would you, would you leave here this morning and say, how many right now just say, Lord, it's hard for me. But by your grace, I want to start seeing stuff from the heavenly viewpoint, not the human viewpoint. Would you? Slip a hand up this morning. I want to start seeing things from a heavenly viewpoint. The bad things, the problems, the people, the persecutions, the mess-ups, the tragedies, the terrible things. 
see them. You know what I've decided? I'm going to look at the election from the heavenly viewpoint. I'm going to vote for Jesus to come back. Amen. <laughs> Hey, why don't you have a word of prayer with somebody? And if you're not saved today, I'll be up here for just a few moments. If you're not saved today, come up here. I'd like to show you out of the Bible how to be saved. You're here today and you're not saved. You say, I came to church to be saved. I want to get saved. You do that today.